Hi, it's midwife Judy and we're going to be doing session two of our antenatal classes online. This session is about how you will manage your labour and some of the pain relief options that we can offer you. We're going to cover some of those unplanned birth events that you might come across with your experience. It's not to scare you but to give you some information so that you can be prepared if this arises for you. After that we're going to have a virtual tour of our labour ward and maternity unit at Rockhampton Hospital. This is a quick review of an average timeline for labour for a first time mum. Remember that the pre-labour time can occur over days to weeks. I encourage you to trust your body in this preparation time, not to get anxious for things to start or impatient for things to hurry along. Your due date should really be a due range of dates because a pregnancy lasting from 37 to 42 weeks is normal. Labour is described by many women as very painful and it occurs over many hours, so your body has to have a special mechanism to help you endure this process. If giving birth was such a terrible ordeal, women would only ever have one baby and never go back. So our species wouldn't survive if women didn't have the capability of withstanding the pain, the capability of forgetting the pain and going back again. So your brain releases special substances to help you manage the sensations of labour and birth. They reduce your perception of pain, they allow you to rest, they give you a more positive emotional state and a selective amnesia once it's over. These substances are called endorphins. They start building late in your pregnancy and they're responsible for what we call pregnancy brain, where you get forgetful and distracted. You do lots of daydreaming and maybe some odd things like putting the milk in the cupboard and the sugar in the fridge. Endorphins. So they are natural substances which are produced in large quantities during labour, building up close to birth and lasting for hours after the birth. Endorphins modify pain. They create a sense of well-being. They boost pleasure. They alter perception of time and place. They can induce euphoria and act similarly to the drug morphine. However, when fearful, our bodies produce adrenaline causing a fight or flight response, creating a surge of energy to either stand up and fight or quickly run away. Sometimes adrenaline makes you freeze. Adrenaline causes endorphin levels to fall and will impair our ability to cope with pain. To help you understand the effect of adrenaline, imagine waking up suddenly in the middle of the night, hearing a very loud banging noise in your house. You don't recognise that noise and your brain tells you that maybe someone's breaking in and coming to attack you. Your brain interprets that noise as a source of danger and something to fear. Fear causes your body to release adrenaline, creating physical changes in your body. I'm certain you've all experienced being in a state of high adrenaline. Your heart starts pounding in your chest, your breathing increases, your pupils dilate to see better in the dark, you start sweating and all your senses are heightened. Your body is ready to either fight that intruder or run away to safety. Now, consider the same scenario again. You're awakened in the middle of the night hearing a loud banging noise but this time, your brain remembers that the loud noise is the bathroom blind banging in the breeze. Your brain senses no threat, interprets no fear, so you have no physical reaction and drift back to sleep. The only difference between these two situations was knowledge. We fear things we don't understand. Knowledge can prevent fear and improve your ability to cope with pain because your endorphins are able to do their job. So let's have a look now at how we can increase our natural endorphins. Trust and have confidence in your body. Be well informed so you know what to expect. Stay calm and focused and set up a peaceful and private space. Be familiar with your environment to increase your comfort. Eliminate any of those disturbances and distractions. Stay mobile and upright to increase your sense of control and avoid pharmacological analgesia. Knowing in advance the physical layout of the room where you will birth is important. This will help you mentally rehearse your labour progressing well 
while using a range of self-help strategies. If you've never been to our maternity unit before, we will help you get more familiar with the virtual tour at the end of this video. Remember that the antidote for fear is knowledge. Knowledge of what's happening in your body, what procedures are going to occur as well as what the environment looks like will help reduce your fear and tension and ultimately your pain. Having realistic expectations of the sensations of labour are also crucial. Don't fight the pain or resist it. If possible, stay at home for as long as you can in early labour. Imagine the pain as progress, that each contraction brings your baby closer to arriving. Remember too that you've only got to deal with one contraction at a time and that the pain eases between each one. Picture the contraction as a walk up a steep hill, reaching the peak and climbing down. It's important that you know that if you take pharmacological pain relief like morphine or codeine, then your endorphin levels will drop dramatically. Endorphins are activated by physiological stress, so you actually need the stress of labour to activate them. So women who have elective caesarean sections have low levels of endorphins and they miss out on that lingering positive effects of these hormones in the body after birth. Now you're going to need a variety of self-help strategies to manage the sensations of labour as each one will only last for a little while. Note the different postures that women adopt in responses to what they're feeling. Labour is hard work. Therefore, resting your body weight is helpful. Note the upright positions. Note the use of water. Note that each of these women have their eyes closed, focusing on the work their body is doing. Note too the value of the support person. It's important to keep hydrated in labour and to keep your bladder empty. Small nutritious snacks are wise to keep your energy up. Wear something that's comfortable and non-restrictive. We will provide a light wraparound dress for you to wear if you choose. Some women get hot during labour and don't want to wear any clothes at all. Some women get cold feet and need to wear socks. Your support person needs to think about their own needs too. They get hungry and thirsty and even cold in the air conditioning. Consider bringing your own music. Consider what else you might like to make this event special and memorable and your own. There are a number of non-drug options to help you deal with the sensations of labour. So I'm just going to read this list. You can use massage or movement, water immersion, heat, pressure, the TENS machine, acupuncture, aromatherapy, music, meditation, hypnotherapy or even sterile water injections. So let's have a look at a couple of these. Massage helps release endorphins. Practicing massage techniques in advance of needing it in labour is helpful. Most women will experience backache late in pregnancy, so it's a good time to hone your skills now. Not all women like to be touched at different stages of labour, so be guided by what she wants at the time. Massaging for the purpose of easing someone's discomfort is a gift, so be generous. I encourage you to find some helpful YouTube videos on massaging techniques for labour. The benefits of using water in labour are well documented. In Rockhampton we have one immersion pool and that's in birth suite 4. If you're planning to use this bath please let us know when you ring up in labour so that we can allocate this room to you. Even if you can't use the bath, being under the shower is an excellent way to labour and our bathrooms are large enough for you to birth in there if you want as well. Please check your local maternity service if they have a bath for immersion in labour or for water birthing. Using a TENS machine can be helpful for women who get backache in late pregnancy and during labour. Little electrodes are placed on the skin. The machine sends tiny electric impulses through your skin to the nervous system to your brain interrupting the other pain messages. This strategy is harmless to you and your baby and won't interfere with your contractions. But you will need to purchase your own equipment as it's not supplied at the hospital. The TENS machine can be used for lots of other aches and pains later in life, so it's a good investment for less than $100.
When the sensation of pain is overwhelming, some women feel they need additional help. These are the four interventional or pharmacological strategies that we can offer. Let's have a look at the first one, the gas. If you choose to use the gas, your midwife will instruct you on the technique of deep, slow breaths that coincide with your contractions. Some women find the gas very helpful, as you control how much and when you use it. It does not affect your contractions, it doesn't affect baby's health, it's portable, allowing you to move around, it's not addictive and can assist with your relaxation and focus during labour. Rarely though it causes nausea, headache and dizziness, but you'll be shown how to remedy these symptoms if you get them. About 30% of women experience severe, continuous low back pain in labour. So sterile water injections involves a tiny amount of sterile water, up to 0.2 of a mil, being injected under the skin at four locations in the lower back. To distract from the stinging sensation, the injections are done during a contraction, simultaneously by two midwives. It works using the gate control theory of pain relief where the fast messages of sting from the skin pass to the brain quickly and close the gate to the slower messages of pain from the contractions. This is similar to how the TENS machine works. Some women get immediate relief of their backache and it has no side effects on you or your baby or your progress of labour. If women need something stronger for pain relief, we can offer a narcotic injection. Now morphine is the drug of choice. It's usually given with medication to reduce your nausea. Morphine takes the edge off your pain, but doesn't take away the pain completely. Two out of three women still report moderate pain one to two hours after the injection. It may make you feel drowsy, allowing you to rest more easily between contractions, but it might make some women feel like they're losing their sense of control and awareness and memory it can be a little bit disorienting. Because all medications that you take go through your body to your baby, sometimes when morphine is taken too close to the birth, it can make your baby sleepy and reluctant to feed. Your baby may also have some trouble regulating their body temperature for a while. The epidural is what we call the big gun for pain relief. It's best for very long, painful labours where all other strategies have not helped the woman cope. It may be best when the labour is a complicated one, such as when the woman has very high blood pressure or there's a high probability that the woman will need some instrumental assistance or caesarean section to birth. Around the spinal cord is the epidural space where many tiny nerves enter. A small tube is inserted into this space and medication is administered either by a continuous infusion or by the woman pushing a button to receive a dose from the machine. The nerves are numbed, stopping the sensation of pain completely. Having an epidural, however, completely changes your normal labour to one that's now medically managed. You would require an intravenous drip, an indwelling catheter in your bladder, continuous CTG monitor, frequent blood pressure monitoring, a left lateral wedge, DVT stockings, no hot packs and your bed bound. You can't even change your position without help and you'll most likely have to birth your baby on your back in lithotomy position. Some women need extra assistance to birth their babies because they don't always get those second stage sensations to push effectively. If you choose this method of pain relief, your anaesthetist will discuss the risks associated with having an epidural before you consent to the procedure. I encourage you to research having an epidural in labour so that you're well informed before you might need one. Many people who choose this option get a good epidural block and are very satisfied with their pain relief. The sensations of second stage are different to first stage. You will feel pressure in your bottom and urge to bear down and push with the contractions. Then as your baby's head emerges from the vagina and crowns, you'll feel a burning sensation as the skin of your perineum stretches. 
Pushing is instinctive when the baby's head presses on the pelvic floor. You may involuntarily move your bowels at this time. This is normal, so don't be embarrassed. Gradual stretching of the perineum with guided expulsive effort reduces the risk of tearing the skin. The pushing of second stage is described by some women as rewarding, as they feel the progress of baby moving with each contraction. Listen to your midwife who will coach you through these final moments of birth. At some point in time, your midwife might ask you to pant, make small puffing breaths to prevent you from bearing down too hard. You'll then be in awe at the arrival of your precious baby, overwhelmed by the physical relief from labour and absolutely proud of your achievement. Now we'll have a look at some of those situations that you might not have planned for. The definition of premature labour is labour occurring before 37 weeks gestation. Here's a list of some of the factors that make you more at risk of having your baby prematurely. 60% of all multiple births are born premature, 13% of all premature births are born to Aboriginal women, and 82% of all perinatal deaths are related to prematurity. We also know that having late or no health care in pregnancy, being of low socioeconomic status, and high levels of psychological stress are characteristics found in women who have preterm births. Threatened prem labour is when you get some of those signs of labour before your 37th week, but it doesn't progress. The good news is that most women with threatened premature labour do not end up having a premature birth. There are some tests and investigations that we can do to determine the likelihood of a premature birth if you're having some of these symptoms. Babies born prematurely have significantly more risks than term babies and require additional monitoring and potentially extended stays in the special care nursery. So what if your baby's upside down? What if your baby's in breech position? Many babies are in breach in the earlier weeks of pregnancy, but go head down in the third trimester. If baby's in a breech position at 36 weeks, a decision is made in consultation with your obstetrician about the management of the rest of your pregnancy, as it will depend on the baby's exact position and approximate size on ultrasound, as well as your obstetric history. So what if your labour doesn't start on its own and you need an induction of labour? Once you go over your due date, you will have a discussion with the obstetric team about arranging an induction of labour so that your baby is born before you get to 42 weeks. That's when the risk factors increase. There are other reasons why an induction of labour is recommended before 40 weeks and these will be discussed with you individually. In Rockhampton, we have a limit on the number of inductions of labours that can be done each day, remembering that safety is our priority. And sometimes this is a source of frustration for women. If they've been booked in, but the procedure is delayed due to unpredictable birthing activity. Women are offered what's called a sweep and stretch after 38 weeks of pregnancy to reduce the number of women who go post-term. This is a low risk, mildly uncomfortable procedure of manually stretching the cervix during a vaginal examination. And it can be done by your midwife or obstetric doctor. The next few slides show some of the methods of induction of labour. Having a catheter inserted into your cervix to stretch it over a period of hours is one of the strategies. A single balloon Foley's catheter shown in this slide is not used very often as it doesn't have as high a success rate as the Cook's catheter, which is a double ballooned catheter that holds higher volumes of water. These catheters are a little uncomfortable, but there's no medical side effects. The second method is to place prostaglandin gel into the vagina behind the cervix. Most women get low pelvic discomfort, we call them prostan pains, for several hours after insertion. 
Very few women get a bad reaction to prostin, but a few women can respond very quickly, and some not at all. Every woman is unique in her response to this medication. The process can be drawn out over a couple of days, which makes women tired and anxious. Cervidol is another form of hormone placed into the vagina. It's slow release and can be left in for up to 24 hours. Once the decision is made to break the waters, we are committed to having your baby delivered in the next 24 hours or so. As the longer the waters are broken, the greater the risk of ascending infection. The bag of waters provide a warm, comfortable, safe environment for your baby, protecting them from the force of contractions. So we know that once they're broken, there can be more compression on the umbilical cord affecting the baby's oxygen supply. We don't routinely rupture your membranes in normal labour for this very reason. Once you have an artificial rupture of membranes, a syntocinin drip is usually commenced to make the contraction start. Syntocinin induction is the ultimate commitment to getting your baby delivered ideally in the next 8 to 12 hours. This medicine does carry the risk of overstimulating the uterus, causing too frequent or prolonged contractions which affect the baby's ability to get oxygenated blood. Having a syntocinin drip does require one-on-one -on -one midwifery care, as every woman's response to this medicine is varied, and close monitoring is required. Forceps are rarely used to deliver babies' heads these days. The most common instrumental delivery is done with a vacuum cup. The vacuum cup is used more commonly as it's easier to apply to the baby's head and it's less risky than forceps. Also, an episiotomy is not always required. The vacuum cup is usually performed when the woman has lost her energy to push her baby out or the baby needs to come quickly because of concern for their well-being. Regardless, maternal effort is still required as the obstetric doctor works with your pushing and your contractions to help the baby out. Note this picture does not show appropriate placement of a vacuum cup. The vacuum cup should be placed on the occiput as shown in the next picture. It's good to be informed of the bruising that's usually seen when a vacuum cup has been applied to baby's head so that you're not alarmed. Sometimes baby may be a little irritable from a headache and observations of their head are made more closely. Extensive bruising might contribute to your baby being a little jaundiced, but that bruising will settle quickly. An episiotomy is done after local anaesthetic is put in and during a contraction as the baby's head extends the perineum. This is where the skin is at its thinnest. The cut is made in a way that will prevent tearing of the skin and muscle of the anus. The stitches are a little bit uncomfortable, but should not be extremely painful. An increasing swelling, bruising or pain in the following hours and days must be reported to your caregivers. So what if you can't have a vaginal birth and you need a caesarean section? So why do you need a caesarean birth? Firstly, it might be because of baby's condition. They might be very growth restricted or there might be a congenital abnormality. Maybe the baby's not in a good position for vaginal birth or your baby gets distressed in labour. Sometimes, even though you've started in labour, the cervix doesn't dilate fully. Sometimes there's some medical conditions or emergencies such as where the placenta's in the wrong place or mum develops eclampsia. And if you've had more than one caesarean section, you may require a repeat. So let's talk about caesarean birth in more detail. A spinal anaesthetic is usually preferred because it's less risky to both mother and baby. You can have one support person in the theatre with you and you get to cuddle your newborn in theatre and get skin to skin contact as soon as possible. You will have your drip and urinary catheter for about six hours after your surgery. It's important to mobilise as soon as possible, take regular painkillers 
and on the third day before you go home, we take your dressing off your wound. Your insurance company will probably say that you can't drive for about six weeks while you recover from this surgery, and the scar on your womb is a slight risk for your next birth. What if you're bleeding too much after birth? Let's talk about postpartum hemorrhage. During pregnancy, your blood volume has increased significantly to cope with blood loss at birth. If the loss is excessive, it becomes an emergency. And you will notice that many staff will come into your birth suite to activate our protocols for postpartum hemorrhage. You're likely to have someone rubbing your tummy to help the uterus contract. You'll have someone putting in an IV cannula to take blood samples and administer fluids. You're likely to have another injection of syntocinin and be given some suppositories to keep the uterus contracted. A lot of activity will happen in a short time and this can be a little bit scary if you don't know what's going on. But we are well trained to deal with this type of emergency which may resolve quite quickly. If you've had a large blood loss at birth, remember that you are at greater risk of having a fall or a faint afterwards. So take extra care when you are getting in and out of bed, when you're carrying your baby, and avoid those long hot showers which will drop your blood pressure. Please continue to do your own research about some of the unplanned events that we've talked about because knowledge is power. You can also choose to watch some normal birth videos again to help you prepare for this life-changing and beautiful experience. We'd like now to take you on a virtual tour of our maternity unit and birth suite in Rockhampton so that you can see how wonderful our facilities are. If you're birthing in another facility, please talk to the staff there so that you can have a tour and be familiar with the environment where you will you access the maternity unit via the front entrance of the hospital. Walk through the main building, past the cafe to the lift foyer, and choose the lift to floor two. As you arrive at maternity on floor two, please present to the reception desk and talk to one of our admin officers. If reception is unattended and the front door is locked, please use the intercom on the wall to speak to staff who will let you in. Each time you enter the ward, we ask that you wash your hands thoroughly at the first hand basin, following those instructions on the wall. As you walk down the corridor, you'll see the postnatal beds on your left, numbered 1 to 18. In the middle of the building, the corridor branches at the staff base. Please talk to one of the midwives at the far end of the desk and provide your pregnancy health record. You will then be taken to one of our procedure rooms for assessment by a midwife. If you're in active labour, the staff will take you to one of our five birth suites. This is a typical birth suite. The midwife has a workstation as you enter the room, which can be sectioned off to give you and your partner more privacy in the room. These are spacious rooms with all the comfort items and safety equipment you might require for birth. Our bathrooms are also spacious enough for you to take advantage of floor mats, birthing ball and chair while using the shower. We're in the process of redecorating all of these rooms with coloured feature walls and inspirational artwork to make this environment feel more homely. At the end of the birth suite corridor is one suite that has a bath for immersion in water during labour. Please let us know if you'd like to use this bath so that we can have it ready for you. Two to three hours after having your baby, you're taken to a postnatal bed. This is a typical three bed bay. Your baby's cot stays at the bedside. You can see there are two cupboards for each bed and a locked drawer. Please bring bags rather than suitcases so they can be stowed safely in the wall cupboards. At most, you might have to share a bathroom with two other women. 
Now if your baby requires admission to special care nursery, it is right beside the birth suites. Entry into special care nursery is restricted to keep our vulnerable babies safe. Each cot space has a comfy recliner chair for mum. Back on the postnatal ward, this is where you'll be shown how to bath your baby. We encourage you to help yourself to the postnatal information pamphlets on the wall in this room. There are five single postnatal rooms, and this is a typical single room. Some of them share a bathroom with the room next door, but all beds have free television and you're welcome to use our free Wi-Fi on your mobile device. At any time of the day, you can access the patient lounge to make yourself a hot drink and use the fridge. The floor plan of maternity is a simple rectangle shape with two main corridors, so it's very easy to navigate around. We hope this tour has helped you feel a little more familiar with our facilities at Rockhampton.